My name is Colette Mazzuccelli. In the Classical Theories and Contemporary Issues in International Relations online seminar, taught by me for Long Island University Global since 2015, it is our responsibility in service to transnational civil society during this unprecedented time of COVID-19 to listen to non-governmental organizations, notably the Syrian Emergency Task Force, which accomplishes political, economic, and legal work to raise awareness about the most pressing, critical humanitarian issue of this early 21st century. We appreciate the occasion to launch this podcast series, Global Connections, Syrian Hidden Voices, to discuss the ways in which the Syrian Emergency Task Force is engaging across countries to bring hope, hope to the orphans, the displaced, the women, the detainees in Syria. Our learning, research, and service aim to make a difference in a fragile world impacted increasingly by the novel coronavirus pandemic, which exacerbates underdevelopment and violence as personal freedom and human rights are consistently violated. It is our hope that the peoples of Syria may one day be able to live in peace together in the country they love. As we study international relations, we take responsibility in our learning to link concepts and practice in the vision of world education articulated by Morris Mitchell and elaborated by his colleagues in Friends World College during the 1960s to this day. In this podcast series, we remain faithful to Mitchell's vision as the legacy of Friends World College lives on in the lives of our LIU Global alumni. Thank you, Muaz and Omar, for joining this podcast today. We look forward to our evolving cooperation with the Syrian Emergency Task Force in this Global Connections Syrian Hidden Voices podcast series. Welcome all to the first episode of Global Connections Syrian Hidden Voices. My name is Olivia Stevens, and I will be hosting these next few episodes. This series is a collaboration between the LIU Global Students and Professor Colette Mazzuccelli's class, Classical Theories and Contemporary Issues in International Relations, and the Syrian Emergency Task Force. The Syrian Emergency Task Force, SETF, is a non-for-profit created to help meet the needs of Syrian peoples fighting for freedom and their rights of democracy for all. Syrian Emergency Task Force was established in 2011 and had multiple programs that advocate for local Syrians and educate the globe about the suffering in Syria. They work in four main areas ranging from humanitarian work to political advocacy and pursuing justice. Their team is made up of individuals from around the world to advocate for a common cause, the humanitarian crisis in Syria, and those affected. We would like to begin this first episode by saying an extreme thank you to every member of the Syrian Emergency Task Force for the opportunity to hear these stories and get involved with your work, to do our part to raise awareness for the human rights violations and strong stories of inspiration of the Syrian revolution. I'd also like to thank Maria Zuniga and Juliana for being instrumental in the process of creating this podcast. Without further ado, we welcome Muaz Mustafa and Omar al Shogri, as well as your dear listener to this podcast. Before we begin, a content warning. This episode contains descriptions of war crimes, violence, murder, and torture. Omar al Shogar is a Syrian activist that speaks freely to the freedom of his country. When the Arabic Spring in 2011 started, he was one of the first students to stand against the cruelties of the Syrian government, which led to his arrestment in the same year. After traumatizing experiences in prison, he was freed and moved to Sweden with his little brother. Today, Omar still advocates for the Syrian crisis, holding the position of Director of Detainees Affairs at the Syrian Emergency Task Force, besides giving lectures about his life experience and the Syrian war. Moaz Mustafa is an activist and the executive director for the Syrian Emergency Task Force. He was born in Damascus, Syria, and moved to the United States as a teenager. Mustafa spent some time on Capitol Hill, working as a staffer for Congressman Vic Snyder and Senator Blanche Lincoln. 
He later joined the Syrian Emergency Task Force in 2011. At the organization, Mustafa leads advocacy in Washington, D.C., as well as leading delegations such as lawmakers and journalists to the Syrian border. He also oversees most of the organization's operations in the United States, as well as on the ground in Syria. Muaz and Omar, would you like to introduce yourselves? Sure, absolutely. Hi, my name is Muaz Mustafa. I'm the executive director of the Syrian Emergency Task Force. I was born in Damascus, but I moved to the United States when I was uh, about nine years old. Um, and after studying international relations and political science uh, and working on the Hill previously, I began working with the Syrian Emergency Task Force in March of 2011. My name is Omar al um I'm 25 years old and Syrian. I grew up on the Syrian coast and I witnessed when the revolution in Syria started and I participated and I've been detained for a few times. The last time I was kept in prison for three years, um, political prison in Syria. Today I work with the Syrian Emergency Task Force and I work for um, another organization called Wake Me Up for um, a tour, um, organization that cares about the mental health and the Nordic countries, and I am a public speaker as well. Thank you so much for those introductions. We are so happy to have you here. We have some questions for Omar first. Would you like to give our listeners some background into the Syrian civil war? I won't say war. I would say the revolution started in Syria in March 15th, 2011, and I was 15 years old at that time. A few kids in the school wrote on the walls, Jake Doria Doctor, which means your turn is coming, doctor. Doctor is the president of Syria, he's an eye doctor. And the security and intelligence services in Syria attacked the school and arrested the children and tortured them and slaughtered them and throw their bodies to their families. And the families reacted to, to the actions of the security and intelligence services in Syria and they went out to demonstrations. And those demonstrations was faced with guns and people being killed. And that's how it started, by a few kids writing on the walls. And it moved from being in a city to moving to my city on March 18, 2011. And I participated in the first demonstration in my town. And it was amazing to be among a lot of people just asking for freedom. I was upset that kids w- were, were killed, tortured in Syria because they wrote some few words uh, on the wall. And I wanted to be in demonstration. I didn't know the value of freedom or democracy or what is dictatorship. It wasn't clear in my mind. It takes time to learn about that. But I, I enjoyed being in demonstration because I knew it was the right thing to do. And I was detained. And so was so were a lot of people in Syria, or detained, or flee to another country, or you live under the regime uh, control where you can be killed, tortured, or whatever. They can take anything from you at any time. That's what people actually stood up against in Syria. It was just you know those children wrote writing on the wall was just a reason to start the revolution. But the problem existed since the, this regime and this party came to the power, a bad party. And people being detained and tortured since, I know about that since 2000, uh, uh, since 1982, because my uncles been detained in 1982 for 12 years each. And they've been tortured. And I remember when they, when, when I knew that they've been detained in Syria, I, I thought my, my uncles were criminals um, because you grow up that the police is who stops the criminals but when the revolution started in syria we knew that the police were the criminals in syria and that was shocking because my father was a retired officer when the revolution started he was officer before and he protected me he protected my siblings i felt like my father was doing something good for for the society then i was faced by guns when they when they uh, attacked my village and killed people and did many massacres where my father and my brothers being killed and they took me to detention centers and tortured me and starved me i was surprised in the beginning but then i understood how this the entire system works um dictatorship grow when when the fear spread in the country 
and the fear was spread everywhere. I remember one day I told my father, I was a kid, maybe nine or 10 years old. I told my father, our president has big ears like a monkey. And my father just raised his arm and hit me as as strongly as possible on my face and said to me, shut up. Then say that again, the walls, hear you, ceiling, the, the doors, the chairs, everything hears you and they can go and tell the president about you. That was some something symbolic for me. It's like, it's, they don't, you know, physically hear you, but that's an example that everybody can be a spy and take you to tell the security intelligence about you and it will be detained. The fear was was everywhere in the country. And that's what we were standing up against, speaking up about um, in Syria. And we've been detained for that. And that's why we have 12 to 14 million refugees um, from a country of 23 million people. Um, so that's why the revolution in Syria started. Thank you so much, Omar. And Moaz, could you tell us a little bit how the Syrian Emergency Task Force got started and what it was like in those first few years? Absolutely. As, as Omar was saying, people were afraid in their own homes to even make a joke or any slight criticism or, uh, of, of any government official, not just the president. And so the wall of fear that existed in Syria for the entire population was incredibly thick and unbreakable, at least in, in my mind. I, I just never thought, even as I watched in Tunisia and in Egypt and elsewhere, people going out and protesting against their authoritarian regimes, did not really think that it would come to Syria. But when it did begin uh, with those children uh, that rode on the wall of their school and then the Nonviolent, peaceful, multi confessional protests across the country that were faced with brutal repression. Um, we, here in the United States, the thinking was well, this is a dictator that destabilizes the region and the world, that is uh, a close ally of all of the adversaries of the United States, whether that be, uh, you know, Iran and, and terrorist group Hezbollah and North Korea and Russia and, and the list goes on and doesn't even cater to sort of Western democracies or anything. So I thought that as people had come out in the millions calling for the same values that we cherish here in the United States and too often take for granted, that it would be hopefully a quick transition that this you know, dictator who at least was a Western trained doctor. So we thought maybe he wasn't as brutal as he could be, you know, in the United States and in international community, the United Nations would, would do a lot to, to help uh, in a transition to a democracy, something similar to what happened in Tunisia, perhaps. And so we established the Syrian Emergency Task Force in 2011 in order to be a bridge, a voice for the people on the ground that are calling for democracy and liberty and freedom um, and their right to self-determination. And we would bring these voices to the halls of power in the United States, the U.S. Congress, and the House and Senate, um, the White House, State Department. Um, and so our initial sort of goal and mission was to be to do political advocacy and bring these voices here. Um, what we learned in those first year or two was that the world was, although made in, in many governments, including ours, made a lot of powerful statements calling for an end to the killing of civilians, calling for the release of men, women, children, elderly from detentions, um, calling for a transition, uh, as the people of Syria were asking for. That's the extent of the action back then, was just statements of condemnations when a massacre happened and statements of supporting the pro-democracy people in Syria. Um, unfortunately, what we learned was that really the world wasn't going to act, um, and we had to sort of evolve uh, in our operations. Number one, into continuing the political advocacy, but working within the parameters of policy that had been set, uh, and trying to sort of push on those walls to try to get more action and try to end the killing, which remains our mission today. Um, but over time, we had to take on um, humanitarian work, 
just because there was such a humanitarian crisis as, as the revolution continued and its violence increased. Um, and war crimes documentation and later on the prosecutions of these war crimes as chemical weapons attacks, conventional weapons, cluster bombs, torture to death continued and continues as we sit right now and speak on this podcast continues to this day. Um, so it's been a, a little over nine and a half years, but those beginning years, I could say, were where we were most hopeful because it was a simpler it was a simpler sort of situation and it became a much more complex conflict over time and the longer that the united states and the world didn't act the more complicated and the worse the options got but one thing that i could say was that the option that was chosen by the international community which was in action had the worst consequences of all. Thank you so much for that, Moaz. And this next question is for the both of you. Moaz, you said that one of the original goals was for political advocacy. Have there been any new goals to that have come about for the Syrian Emergency Task Force, as well as in both of your work as Executive Director and as Director of Detainees Affairs? Sure, I can maybe start and, and let Omar um, add uh, just our main mission is is become clearer to us now, even from the beginning. It's to end the killing, to end the war in Syria. Just stop, uh, you know, because as as Omar mentioned, twelve to fourteen million displaced, over a million have been killed. The United Nations stopped counting at half a million, um, hundreds of thousands by conservative estimates, two hundred and fifty thousand remain in Assad's prisons, where Omar can tell you what what unfolds in there. Um, so our political advocacy continues to be to bring a political solution and a transition to democracy in Syria through, and it must be through the leadership of the United States and the international community um, working together, because the UN Security Council has been impotent due to the Russian veto and the Chinese veto, big allies of the regime. Our other goal has been... Well, what we realized, though, as well, is in order to bring action, you have to have political will and you have to move the people, especially, you know, when we live in democracies, it is it is the people that can move their government. And so we started outreach um, to different universities and communities and faith groups across the United States um, so that raising awareness became part of that political advocacy mission, working on different documentaries, um, including Red Line, for example, that actually documents the first four years or so of, of SETF operations, or Syria's Disappeared, that talks about detentions, and working with outlets like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post and, and, and radio and TV to try to, to highlight what's happening, and that remains a big part of our mission. Um, we also... Um, started a school for orphans because there's so many children that have no education that are internally displaced that has been really a bright light in, in our work. Um, and we started a women's center to train um, women that are the spinal cord of Syrian society, especially today with the war. Um, many of them are widowed or have lost uh, family members. And so we help them help their own communities and raise them up in the midst of, of an ongoing war. Um, we work with camps like Rukban and IDP camp in the south, uh, where 10,000 people are besieged and starving with no other organization aiding them, um, unfortunately, other than, than what we are able to bring in. And finally, um, working uh, with defectors and, and, and heroic witnesses and survivors, um, we have become custodians of the Caesar file, which is... Uh, a file um, which is uh, based on a photographer, a friend of ours and a member of our team, codenamed Caesar, who smuggled out almost 55,000 photographs of men, women, children, and elderly that have been tortured to death. Uh, and we are trying to identify who they are, give the you know, information to their families in the hopes that we can give their families closure. There are so many people that don't know if their loved ones are alive and still being tortured or, or, or have passed, um, and to pursue prosecution um, against the Assad regime. And unfortunately, since the International Criminal Court has not been an option for us, because Syria is not signed to the Rome statute, not signatory to the Rome statute, and because the UN Security Council referral to the ICC is constantly vetoed by the Russians and the Chinese, 
we've had to rely on national courts and creative ways of trying to pursue accountability and justice. And so um, our mission and our goals have, have expanded, but at the heart, it remains an end to the killing in Syria and a transition to a democracy that the Syrian people deserve. Our mission is to help the Syrian people achieve freedom. To, to help them achieve that, we have to work with every individual. Uh, in every country, we have to raise awareness. We have to work with you. We have to tell you what's going on in Syria because we need the U.S. administration. We need the British administration. We need the French. We need every government in the world to react, to do something. And governments, they, they don't react if the people, the population of this country don't ask for that. So what we try to do is try to reach out to as much as many people as possible by the Caesar exhibition or uh, doing public speaking or events or using platforms, social media platforms, and everything possible to bring awareness. Because it's not about giving information to people, uh, that people can get this information and go home and sleep well and forget about that because their life is full of things. We understand that people have their own lives and they are busy. When you ask, how can I help? We give you something concrete that you like to do. So when somebody asks me if a lecture or, or an, an exhibition, what can I do? I ask these people, what do you like to do? Are you are you 85 years old? Do you have kids? Your kids maybe have kids. Then you have a school of, of people there you to tell uh, about what's going on in Syria because I believe youth have the most power, but everybody ha has the power to, to change. And do you like doing videos? We can give you materials to do a video. Do you like to write? We can give you a story to write and to, to, to pitch that to your local we, we ask people to tell us what they like. By knowing that, we can give people opportunity to help while they are enjoying their days. You don't want people to get very involved and think they don't like. It's like, yeah, contact your congressman. And people, a lot of people may say, I hate politics. I don't know how to write an email to a congressman. We says, like, th that's not what you should do then. Because that's not nothing you like doing. And if you want to help from your heart, be the most productive helper, you need to do something you like. Um, use your sport, your, your, your hobbies, your social media, the things you like the most to help. That's the most efficient way. Because it's easy when you look at Syria, a country that people only recognize it because of the war. It's, it's so sad. When you say to people, when I say Syria, what do you think of? It's like dead people, refugees, war. They didn't know about Syria in 2010, when we had a great country, where we had great everything except the politics and the corruption the regime had. We had like we had the mountains, we had the ocean, we have the the beautiful nature, free school, we have the uh, healthcare, we have had everything and a civilization for far, far, far many years before the U.S. exists um, on the map. And so, so we're trying to tell people that what's going on in Syria could happen everywhere. And what's, what's those people you can see in the, in the, as refugees or dead bodies in the Caesar photos, they have stories, they have families, they have had feelings, they try to be alive, they try to escape, they try to have a better life, but they could not. And there is people who are trying to get a better life, but they need us. They need our help. They may not be able to achieve it themselves because the brutal forces of the Syrian regime are getting supported by the Russians, by the Iranians, by the Chinese, by the North Korean, by the Iranian, by a lot of big forces. So we can't just, the Syrian, the Syrian people can't face the Syrian regime by themselves. They need our help. And that's actually why we started the revolution because we knew the world was going to help us but when after three four weeks we, we thought the regime will fall in three or four weeks like in tunisia but that didn't happen and we expected that the world to 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 help us um but we saw nothing happening when it become a crisis they give aid that's 
Food is not what people needed. Tents is not what people needed. Money is not what people needed. Going to another country is not what people people needed help to achieve their freedom so they can stay in their home. In an amazing country that just being corrupted and destroyed by this regime, that's what they needed. And we instead waited for so many years until the regime breaks the country, totally breaks the country, destroy it, and people need aid. They don't think anymore freedom is not the main thing because your brain will prioritize the most important thing for you to survive. So when you're starving, you don't think about freedom. When you're thirsty, you don't think about freedom. When you have both of them and you're safe, you're up, then you think about freedom. And we, we, we ended up leaving the Syrian people starved in many places. Not all of them, but in many places, they have horrible situation. In Rukban camp in Syria, people are starving if we don't send them this very, very small amount of of aid the Syrian Emergency Task Force with, with its small capacity can provide to those people. Some medicine, some some clothes sometimes. And that's just disgusting to see how many countries in the world talks about human rights and democracy and they let the people in Syria die. And it's not on, only in Syria, it's in the entire world when you talk about democracy and human rights, you you implement that in, only in your country. And that's wrong translation or implementation of human rights, because it's a human rights, not Swedish human rights. It's not American human rights. It's not European human rights. It's a human rights in general for every human. So it could be just Swedish rights, right? And we implementing it as a, in a very, very wrong way when we just give value for the life of few people, a few countries, not the rest of the people. Thank you so much for that, Omar. On behalf of the LIU Global Community, the Going Global Podcast, and the Syrian Emergency Task Force, we thank you, dear listener, for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and we'll leave you with Syrian music thanks to producer James Mirabello. (laughs) 